We're now on to the last session of the day and of KF 2021. We now uh, look back at our gloriously rich past to find the forgotten lessons therein. It is surprising how much of these vital details have been forgotten or have been expunged. From Maratha princes who parodied caste to Muslim deities in Hindu temples, from revering goddesses with no breasts to a goddess with three, our mythology and history have many lessons that need to be rediscovered. We have with us the duo of uh, Manu Pillay and Malini Nair. At 31, Manu has accomplished many milestones from managing the parliamentary office of Dr. Shashi Tharoor to working at the House of Lords in Britain with Lord Karan Moria and with the BBC on their Incarnations history series, assisting Dr. Sunil Kilnani to publishing three books and winning the Tata Prize for the first non-fiction book and the Sahitya Academy Yuva Puraskar, Manu has really been busy. His first book was the award-winning The Ivory Throne, Chronicles of the House of Travancore. Two years later came Rebel Sultans, the Deccan from Kilji to Shivaji, and most recently he's given us The Courtesan, The Mahatma and the Italian Brahmin, Tales from Indian History. Manu is also text contributor to Serena Chopra's Bhutan Echoes and for three years wrote a weekly column for Mint Lounge. He's alumnus of uh, Ferguson College, Pune, and is currently enrolled as a PhD candidate at King's College, London. Conversing with Manu is Malini Nair, a senior editor and culture writer whose interest lies in how gender, politics, and history influence trends in dance, music, and theater. She has a special interest in the classical arts and how they are shaped by contemporary events. Over to you, Malini and Manu. Uh, hi, I'm uh, very happy to welcome everyone to this evening session on uh, Forgotten Stories from India's uh, Rich Past. And uh, there couldn't be a better speaker on the subject because Manu has written uh, three books in the last five years, all of them dealing with uh, less known aspects of um, Indian history. Um, so the question is, uh, why should we talk at this point about uh, India's um, forgotten stories? <clears throat> um, uh, I think, and this is something Manu mentions in his latest book also, that we now live in a very polarized world and history has become a tool to generate acrimony. Um, but the fact is there was a time in India's past when uh, diverse communities and cultures um, not only coexisted, <coughs> uh, but also enriched each other. So I think at this point, it has become imperative for us to recall uh, these stories from India's past. Uh, Manu, your uh, latest book is actually a fascinating kaleidoscope of stories. And I think what I really liked about them was that uh, they defy many uh, current notions about Indian history. Uh, did you go searching for these stories? Did you go searching for specific themes? Um, how did this book come about? I think, and then, hi, man, you know, good to meet you uh, finally. I must say on the topic of books that the moment your camera came on, I was trying to figure out what the titles in your background are. I know three ah, of them are Murti okay. Library I hope books, but I can't tell. <laughs> no, now, coming to your question, yeah. you know, it's not yeah. that difficult. When you say these are unheard of or unknown stories, the fact is these stories are all around us. It's just a question yeah. of are we looking for them? Are we really going out of our way to notice the stories that are really standing right in front of us? It's just that we've been trained or we've sometimes been wooed away from history that we don't really give a second glance to things, yeah. uh, things that are in, you know, right around us. We don't even need to go looking very far. Uh, you know, yeah. for example, my first book, you know, the, the protagonist is this yeah. sort of lost Maharani of Travancore. She only died in the 1980s. Yeah. So it's not like she's a very obscure, yeah. you know, faraway figure. But the thing is, there what you see is because she was a woman, she sort of got sidelined and footnoted as opposed to male rulers who are sort of, you know, still celebrated and, yeah. and, and fated. It's the same with the second book, The Deccan Sultans. You know, I grew up in Maharashtra where 
we have you know stories of the moguls stories of, of course the chhatrapati shivaji but we really don't forget uh, we really don't talk about the fact that shivaji didn't emerge in a vacuum right the platform on which he built what became the maratha swaraj was actually created by these sultanates many of which were shia oriented towards persia and did their own very fascinating cultural experiments they had you know blends of you yeah. know a muslim dynasty founded by a brahmin a uh, sunni muslim calling himself son of saraswati and ganapati of course there were others who were highly orthodox whether they yeah. were hindu or muslim and you've got so many stories there which you as a child yeah. i would hear things about them there were these brief cameo appearances that these characters made but we never really read about it the school textbooks of course have their own agenda different governments keep changing textbooks for one very obvious reason because you know whatever whatever sort of helps them uh, give greater currency to their own uh, ideologies yeah. and agendas is what they what sells for them uh, so the stories were around us it's just that you know reaching out and trying trying to unearth them is really the the question and if you make the slightest effort you find that you know it's it's actually very rewarding and they're not all that difficult to find sometimes it's just a question of gaze you know we are so used yeah. to looking yeah. at things in a patriarchal way for example that the moment you learn what feminism is or you put on that particular uh, hat you really start looking at the same story yes. in a new way the same character suddenly has a different dimension which you didn't notice before simply because you weren't looking yeah. at it that way so a lot of it is simply mm. you know lack of being trained to look at these things you know lack of having the the sort of uh, you know intellectual tools perhaps to look at it in the right way but the stories are there so i don't i can't take credit mm. for unearthing them the stories are all there it's just a yeah. question of trying to put it out into the mainstream right so actually uh, to get back to the subject of your book on the rebel sultans of the deccan uh, it actually paints a picture of a land that's really sophisticated elegant erudite very very cosmopolitan almost a global hub uh, you know i mean there are flemish traders russian travelers italian doctors persian artists it's like half the world was sitting in the deccan uh, why do we know so little of this history then i mean why have these splendors passed us by i mean why do we not know enough about this what do you think you know this often happens to cities also right so for example if you go to bijapur which is you know mm. now not really on too many tourists maps it's not yeah, talked about it's internationally not. it's not something you see too much on instagram and facebook you know you see the taj all over the place you see delhi of course all over the place you'll even see hyderabad all over the place but you don't really see that much of bijapur or bidar or these smaller towns but they have such a wealth of you know monuments and architecture and so much there to to actually go and spend a couple of days but that's the thing you know the reason i mentioned cities is that often what happens is bijapur was of course ruled by the adil shahs of of bijapur uh once they were defeated towards the end of the 17th century the moguls had no interest in keeping up the city for them it was a it was an expanding sort of military frontier they kept going on further south yes. and the city ceased to have patrons so a lot of these monuments are there but the city lost a lot of its vitality as a result of which the stories you know even the art that was created half the art is either sitting in rajasthan or the the rest of the art is sitting in in american and and british museums because it was all exported you know first uh, the conquering uh, rajputs and moguls took away a lot and then in the british period a lot of other things were taken away overseas now the result is that when there are no storytellers when there's no court when there's no poets left when there's no patronage left the the songs and the lore of these cities suddenly you know there's nobody really to tell them and there's no not enough people to listen to them you look at hyderabad on the other side on the other hand you find that it was ruled by the qutub shahs from whom the moguls took it and then it eventually it became the capital of the nizams of hyderabad but because the nizams were there the city is still a thriving dynamic you know major city it still got lots of storytellers the emphasis yeah. is on the nizam but even so the city still remains as a very strong uh you know the, the point on the cultural map because there are still storytellers for that city it's the same you know the, with with characters historical figures often what happens is that in the present we make certain choices you know much as the present is informed by the past the present has its own politics so we choose certain heroes and we discard others we figure, we look at you know women characters in one way and then try to mute the other dimension of these women characters we make certain choices I and mean, i think we it's not just the here and now but you know maybe a few generations in our time as as it were and that ends up again creating a sort of you know certain characters get highlighted and others get forgotten for instance you know uh, after after 1947 of course the freedom struggle was the big major sort of you know strand in, in that time 
but it sort of also became a dominant strand so you know you yeah. have for example the maharajas being caricatured as B british lackeys drinking champagne all the time you know flashy cars and not dancing girls and that was it but in reality if you dig into princely india you find an alternative history of nationalism you find an alternative approach to communalism you find sure. very interesting characters a maharaja like sayaji rao gaikwad was called the patron of sedition because he was financing nationalists uh, supporting yeah. the nationalist cause attending and speaking at congress meetings and so on so you find that actually it's a little more complicated but because you know this freedom was hard won there were certain values that were enshrined you know it, it the freedom struggle be, took the limelight and these other characters sort of you know or, or this other side indirectly ruled india fell into the foreground into the background because it was no longer uh, it didn't have enough people invested in telling those stories some of that is being rectified now more and more people are coming out and trying to tell these stories and i think it's just it's just a question of time before we we start covering a lot of these neglected areas of indian history because the frank truth is the stories are splendid it's just so much material you know for any historian or academic or researcher india still got such a wealth of information and it's got so yeah. much that still needs to be excavated you know physically as well as intellectually and i think you know that space will keep growing i don't see a a, a limit to that anytime soon Hmm. But the sidelining of these histories, do you think that it has anything to do with geography, uh, the lack of proximity to Delhi? Uh, do, do, you, do you believe that, for example? Do you think I that think Deccan, I do to a certain extent. Because, yeah. yeah, because, you know, a lot of things, this is also about who gets to speak, right? So if you're in the yeah. capital, in many ways, you have greater yeah. access to the government schemes, yeah. the scholarships, yeah. the fellowships. You know, you can sort of yeah. socialize with the, the the bureaucrats who make those decisions, or your literature festival directors. I really shouldn't complain because you know I've not really got a bad deal from anybody. But in general, you notice these things, right? You you find that proximity to a place of power, proximity to a place where the decisions are being made, does impact who gets to speak, when, and how much they can speak. You know, so it is true that. Uh, one of the reasons north indian history dominates is also because north india still dominates indian politics even to this day you know look at the number of seats uh, and uttar pradesh gets in parliament versus the number of seats kerala gets which is about 19 seats and uttar pradesh is about 80 something uh, and and the thing is you know so naturally there's going to be a very dominant block working in parliament versus another block which is smaller and must build allies to be heard Yeah, I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you get the point. You know, the, the numbers yes. are, are in yes. a way a yes. stark reminder of how it's a little lopsided in terms of how these things are how these things are distributed. And the same no, happens with history. You find Sorry. that you know a lot of uh, northern stories. The Mughal Empire gets a lot of attention partly because it was the last big empire. The British themselves were obsessed with it. Uh, they've left a wealth of records and a wealth of material evidence. So naturally, that gets a lot of focus. Vijayanagar does not get that much focus because Vijayanagar died in the 16th I mean in the 17th century itself the capital was lost hampi was lost in 1565 and by the 1650s the empire was you know, was almost on its in, in, in its final sort of phases the result is your material is therefore sparser there isn't enough material to play with when compared with uh, delhi and the moguls for example so that also ends up affecting what stories get told and what stories uh, you know get more researched or, or more people who, Uh, speak about them. So a lot of this is, yeah, it is politics, it is geography, it is you know access to power, it is a lot of these things that decide you know uh, which stories get to be told. You know, I, I was just thinking that our education system probably has something to do with this imbalance. Also, say by the time we are all done with say twelfth standard in school, we know next to nothing about the history of the northeast. I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't. Uh, we know far less about. about no no far less we know a little less about the south maybe many corners of india yeah so uh, do you think this feeds into this uh, lack of understanding or interest in these histories i mean it does i think because you know to begin with the textbooks are pretty dry so it's almost it's all, not like the textbooks are actually yeah. uh, encouraging an interest, interest in history to begin with you know people right. who do get interested in history uh, it's usually through other reading or at high school level or even you know college level university level that's where you really start having something of an improvement in the kind of material that is that is placed before you even in an academic setting uh, but yeah so i mean leaving that aside yeah it, it is true that you know these the fact that we don't have enough even in the textbooks about these marginalized physical spaces does breed more of the same problem you know it results in more and more of the same issue again and again
However, as I said, I'm not, you know, and, and it does create lopsided ideas even about how we view India as a whole, right? So for instance, we always, and this is an example I give as a standard example, we always think of the arrival of Islam in India and you think swords raised in the Sindh, temples being attacked, Brahmins being killed, that kind of an image. But the yeah. frank truth is if you change your geographical sort of angle, you come to South India, you find that well before those invasions took place, Islam had already come to the South very peacefully. You know, uh, Kerala's founding political legend has this legendary king called Cheraman Perumal. He's, he apparently witnesses the prophet splitting the moon, decides to get on a boat and go to, to Arabia. And then he divides his kingdom between all these local royal families who still exist. Yes. You know, their yeah. legend begins with a king who goes off to Mecca. So yeah. if you look, look to the south, you find that actually you know, Islam came in a very different way to the south. So yeah. simply yeah. sort of balancing the two gives you a slight gives you a pause at least when you sort of stereotype Islam as a completely cruel religion, you know, full of barbarian, barbaric sort of ideas and all that. If you just look at the South, you get a completely different picture where Islam not only came peacefully, but often adapted to local cultures. You know, the, the only Muslim royal family in Kerala, the Arakel family, they're matrilineal, which is not something that's, yeah. that comes from the Sharia or from Islamic law. It's a local cultural it's attribute it's a local. That, that Islam adapted to, you know, and, and you find lots of examples like this, frankly, even in North India, even where it was invaders, it, invaders, once they became kings, they had to become also diplomats. You know, you can't be in invader mode once you've got power and you need to tax people. You can't go around killing so-called infidels once you need to get them to cultivate their lands and pay you revenue. So a lot of this can get balanced out if you look at, at Indian history in, in, you know, in, in a greater sort of sense rather than in, in a lopsided way where one region or one uh, area gets highlighted. Hmm. Uh, I also think that uh, there is a lot of misinformation floating around on various aspects of our history. Uh, for example, I uh, cover uh, Indian music, and when I speak to a lot of Hindustani musicians, they say that the southern music is pure. Because it was um, uh, insulated from the influence of the uh, invaders, uh, whereas the northern music is diluted. Uh, whereas the fact is that if you delve even a little bit into Indian history, is that you know Persianate kind of influences really enrich the Hindustani music system, and you hear this view from those uh, who practice music as well. Uh, so is, is this, do you think, like a, um, a kind of a deliberate um, misinformation? Do you think this is something they've imbibed uh, so deeply that we can't look at the facts behind these myths? Yeah, I mean, to begin with, nothing is pure. I mean, the very idea of culture is that it is organic. It is always changing. It is always growing. It's always absorbing as much as it's giving out into the world. You know, culture is not, as I often say, it's not a rock that you put in a cage, in a gilded cage, and you lock it and sort of protect it. Culture is constantly changing, you know. I mean, uh, look at, if you go and look at the Lepakshi murals of Vijayanagara, you know, there, there's one set of people who say Vijayanagara was this great Hindu empire. It was all about right. Hindu culture and Hindu might. But you look at the Lepakshi murals and you see that the, the clothes that the, the Vijayanagara you know, people wore, Krishna Devaraya's time onwards, very much influenced by Persian fashions. The kind yes. of caps they wore, the kind yeah. of long robes they wore. It's yeah. a little bit like we, I'm wearing like, you know, trousers which come from the West originally. But it, it doesn't mean I'm a Westerner, right? It, 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 it's a cultural sort of exchange thing that happens. Uh, you, you find endless examples like this. Raja Ravi Varma, the painter, in the 20th century after his death, a lot of modernists and you know nationalist artists, Bengal school, etc., they said, oh, you know, he's not an authentic Indian painter because even though he painted Indian subjects and epics, etc., scenes from the epics, he was doing it in a Western medium, you know, oil on canvas, realist style, etc., which is not, which is un-Indian. So he wasn't really uh, birthing a national aesthetic. Now, what's the interesting thing is, if you take that argument backwards into time, uh, the, the Muslim Sultan of Bijapur I mentioned earlier, who you know described himself as he was a Sunni Muslim, but called himself son of Saraswati and Ganapati, Ibrahim Adil Shah II. He commissioned a painting of Saraswati, which, if you look at, you know, at one glance, it looks like any other Islamic princess. You know, she's wearing Islamic clothes or Persianate, you know, clothes. Yeah. The miniature style is very Persianate and, and Islamic in quotes. 
But then you look closely and you start seeing the Veena, the conch, all the yes. emblems of Saraswati are present because his Saraswati was depicted in an Islamic style. Go yes. back to temple sculptures. Those Saraswatis are, are depicted in a completely different way. Goddesses in the temple sculptures don't cover their torsos, for example. There's no blouse, there's no sari, etc. Whereas Ravi Varma incarnated them in a colonial period because of Victorian morality and all that, fully covered up, wearing this new uh, pan-Indian sari that was recognizable everywhere. And ever since then, look at serials, the Mahabharata serial along that. You know, yes. all those serials, when they depict these, these gods, etc., it's in the Ravi Varma mold that they are depicted now. That has become perfectly Indian. Today, if you were to go and tell somebody who watched those serials in the 80s that, oh, you know, this is not authentic. Authentic is topless women in the sculptures. Those are the ones who should be uh, resurrected. People are going to be scandalized because that's not their idea of tradition anymore. You know, look at uh, the Sikh turban. You know, there's we often hear get these reports of how in the West, you know, a Sikh soldier or a Sikh government employee is forbidden to wear his turban, and that becomes a matter of identity. Yeah. And then, you know, there's always a backlash. The interesting thing is that turban didn't exist till the 19th century. Sikhs wore turbans, but turbans plural in different styles. So you go back to Ranjit Singh's court. You look at all the all the miniature paintings and portraits from that time. You find a variety of of turban styles. There was no standardized Sikh turban as we associate it now. There was no Sikh yeah. turban as such. There were turbans. What happens is the British come in and they have Sikhs in the army, and army armies always need uniforms, and therefore you end up having a standardized turban. Now that standardized colonial army turban has become the you know, integral Sikh turban, especially for those who live overseas. It's interesting, right? Like something that was born in the colonial period yeah. for a colonial purpose is internalized and it becomes something else. Uh, the English language, you know, the English language at one time was perhaps the colonizer's language. But the great thing about the early nationalists was they picked up the colonizer's language, they picked up the colonizer's yeah. grammar book and then told the colonizer, hey, you speak about democracy. Why aren't you giving me some? You know, you, you sort of reclaim that something that the yes. colonizer you reclaim for your own purposes after which it becomes very much indian you know it, it becomes very much an indian language so it's the same with all of these all of these you know questions of purity authenticity etc cetera, etc cetera. they're vastly exaggerated uh, you know mm -hmm. even revivalism in some ways i have an issue with because revivalism again presumes that there was one pure earlier version right. forget that those earlier versions were also born out of various dynamics they didn't That's spring true. one fine morning out of thin air, you know, in, in, in fully formed and in, in, in intact form. They, they were created over time. They were products of their own period and their own histories. And yeah. we have to therefore learn to look at these things with maturity rather than this, this thin skinned anxiety, you know, where everything needs yes. to be either pure or contaminated. And there's nothing in between. And the frank truth is, That's you know, true. everything is usually in that middle area uh, with degrees yeah. of some original element, but a lot of other things that have added to it over, over the years and over generations. That's right. Uh, your essay on uh, Shakuntala in your latest book, I found it really interesting, uh, where you're comparing uh, Shakuntala as she's seen by Kalidasa and as she's seen in the Mahabharata. And you point out that in uh, Mahabharata, she's seen as a far more uh, a stronger person who had an agenda as opposed to the Shakuntala who we know as a kind of a coy, oppressed sort of an uncomplaining sort of a figure. Yeah. Uh, so it seems to me that we allow our ideals and agendas to dictate how we uh, see figures from the past. Uh, uh, for example, a couple of years ago, I was researching for a piece on Baiju Bhagra. And I found to my uh, utter surprise that none of the existing uh, history texts supports this persona we have created of the man as a kind of a Hindu ascetic musician who trumped Kansen's Mughal arrogance. He lived in another period. He, he <laughs> sang another kind of music from the one we see in the films. Uh, he, he worked for another court altogether. Actually, there is nothing of this persona in uh, reality. Uh, did you see this happening often in the characters, the people, your books, that we sort of remolded them for our agendas? In fact, the remolding keeps happening not just in our time, but it's happened in the past also. You know, the Shakuntala yeah. version, you have the original epic Shakuntala, where yeah. even in the story, now what is the story we usually hear? Shakuntala is in her adoptive father's ashrama, the king comes hunting, sees her, falls in love with her, 
uh, you know, after they've whatever done their Gandharva Vivaha, he gives her a ring, and that is a sort right. of token of affection. Right. Uh, and then she ends up uh, having a son, and she she goes with the boy. You know, in in Kalidas version, she doesn't have a son; she's pregnant. And I think she goes to the court. On the way, of course, uh, the ring is lost. In the middle, yeah. like, uh, another sage has come and cursed her, saying that this man will forget you uh, unless he sees the ring. And the ring is naturally lost. Uh, the king doesn't recognize her. She weeps. Her mother takes her away. She has the son. Eventually, the, the ring finds its way to the king. And, you know, that's how they end up being reconciled. This is Kalidasa's version. Now, already in remolding it, He's trying to, in a way, he's communicating changing social mores and ideas of his time. So in Kalidasa's yeah. version, we're getting a shift of what is happening in his contemporary society. What is being held up as the ideal woman in Kalidasa's time about 1,500 years ago, that comes across to us. Because what is the original Mahabharata version? Dushanta arrives, there are no maids, there are no intermediaries. He basically yeah. looks at Shakuntala and says, lie with me, woman of wonderful thighs or whatever. Yes, and she yes. says, okay, fine. I mean, first she says yeah. no, but then she says, fine, if you want to go ahead with this, you have to give me a promise that my son will be heir to your kingdom. And he says, okay, fine. There is no ring, there is no curse, there is no angry sage, there is no fish. None of those things happen. All that happens is Shakuntala has a divine pregnancy of 36 months. I mean, I can't believe how she endured that. But anyway, 36 yeah, I, months. I was later, quite staggered by that. <laughs> it's quite scary. But yeah, she has a baby, takes the boy with yeah. her to the court, where Dushanta actually recognizes her. He actually says to himself that, you know, if a stray woman walks in with a child and says it's mine, what, what will my courtiers think? Therefore, he lies. He says that, you know, you're trying to pass off somebody else's yeah. child as mine. I don't recognize either of you. And Shakuntala does not weep. She doesn't wait for her Apsara mother to come and save her. She looks him in the eye and she says, you know, even without you, my son will rule all the worlds. You rule the earth, I fly the skies. That's the kind of defiant attitude she has. Yeah. And then, of yeah. course, the magical voice tells Dushanta not to lie. And he says, okay, fine. I was just, you know, uh, lying for these Kidding strategic you. reasons. <laughs> so she's not a weepy woman. Uh, look at Ahalya. You know, we have the story of Ahalya, uh, which is usually the Ram Charitmanas in the later versions, where, you know, she's... Indra comes and fools her. Indra comes disguised as her husband, fools her, and then, you know, her, her actual husband curses her, and she disappears into a rock till Rama comes in and sort of, you know, redeems her. The interesting thing is in the original story of Ahalya, in the original Ramayana, there is no... She's not deceived by Indra. When Indra comes disguised as her husband, she actually knows this is not her husband. She knows there's something that's off here. She knows that this man is faking it. Yes. But she yes. has curiosity. She has perhaps desire. And the thing is, the original epic was willing to make space for a woman's curiosity, a woman's desire. Whereas a later retelling decided, no, no, Ahalya has to be extremely chaste. So she must have been a fool. She can't have known that this was somebody else. Yeah. There's even questions on whether she turned into a rock or whether she had to just stand still and meditate as a rock rather than becoming a rock. So again, that transition of the original Ahalya into the chaste, innocent, deceived Ahalya tells you more about society changing and society's approach to women changing rather than uh, anything about the epic itself. You know, it's not really about the character. It, it tells you more about us and our changing ideas of a lot of these uh, topics. Um, even, and this is not confined to you know, Kalidasa's time, etc. As late as the 19th century, you know, in the book, I also have this essay on Muddupalni, who was a Devadasi in Tanjavu, who wrote yeah. one of the first works of erotica where a woman's uh, sensuality yeah. is, the, is the chief topic, where yeah. Radha has to be satiated by Krishna. Just because Krishna yeah. is, a, is divine does not mean that he, you know, uh, has to, he, he can sort of ignore Radha's claim to desire. Now, the interesting thing is when it was first translated, of course, in a highly censored way in the 19th century, the translators changed the name from Muddu Palni to Muddu Pille because they thought a, a masculine <laughs> sounding name would be, would be easier for, for people to swallow than to deal with a woman talking about her desire yeah. and, and, you know, yeah. dialogues where Radha yeah. says, where Krishna says, even when I'm tired, Radha wants to begin the game of love. You know, this um, was embarrassing yeah. in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this is really a reflection of our insecurities rather than something that happened in the past. Why we pick and choose something and not other things tells us more about ourselves Our rather sense, than yeah. uh, what the original creators of all these epics, etc. had in mind. Yeah. Almost uh, feel okay. like I'm intruding into this conversation because it's just so fantastic. But I do want to, uh, I'm only going to be here as a medium uh, for questions from the audience. We've got a lot of questions pouring in. 
So uh, if uh, I can just ask a couple of questions uh, to actually both Manu and Malini. So there are a couple of questions for you as well, Malini. So if that's okay with you, maybe I can ask a few questions and then you can uh, uh, you know, take on from there. So the first question is from Lisha Ann Pereira, uh, a BSc student from St. Aloysius College. Uh, to Manu, uh, what inspired you to start writing? And she has aspirations of becoming a writer. So who's someone who's just starting out, what would you, how would you respond well, to that? You know, there's no, people often expect a romantic answer to this, that, you know, writing is, it'll flow into you and it's a talent and all that. But the frank truth is, writing is like any other profession. You really have to uh, slog. The more you write, the better you get at it. It really is as much a craft as it is an art, which means that you really have to practice, which makes you sharper in the way you 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 do your writing, etc. And uh, yeah, then that's the only way to to become a writer, to really persevere, to really uh, keep doing it like you would any other profession. I think I usually give the analogy of a carpenter. You know, you really have to hammer away. You really have to polish it. You really have to shape it. And then when you put it all together, you have a, a beautiful object. It's not as though uh, it's some kind of artistic enterprise in its own right. It takes a lot of slogging, but it's not something that's un impossible. It's something that can be done. Uh, you can you can plan your life around it, and you may not necessarily be able to depend on it for your bread and butter. But it's not impossible to to make a career of writing in in today's world. Uh, a related question from Aishwarya Ramesh, uh, again a BCom student from Central Loishas. What inspired you to write about past events and uh, share these lesser known historical stories uh, in your books and in your writing? Well, you know, because I was always surprised by the stories that I heard of from, let's say, informal sources, you know, my grandmother, people, you know, around me, as opposed to the stories, the sanitized stories that we were taught in school textbooks. One example is, you know, I, I remember as a teenager reading one of these old Travancore government reports, you know, this was before I began work on my first book, but I was still interested in Travancore history. And it talked with great reserve about polyandry among the among you know communities in Kerala. Basically, you know, polygamy is where men have multiple wives. Polyandry is where a woman can have multiple male partners. And there was this great embarrassment about it. And it, it, this was a 1906 publication that basically said, oh, polyandry is very, very, very rare now. You know, it barely happens and perhaps only among lower class people. And I took it at face value then. Till a few years later, in Kerala, in my own ancestral village, my grandmother told me of two women who had passed away by then, of course, but, you know, they, they had joined, I mean, a marriage with two brothers, you know, so each of them was married to two brothers rather than just one of them. Uh, and I ended up meeting a woman in her 90s who's the widow of two brothers like this. She's still alive and she still lives in that village. And, you know, she's got very, like, middle-class children. They've all built fine houses for themselves. But it's happened as late as the 20th century. So I realized that there's, there's a slight, I mean, there's something interesting, right? The, a 1906 report tells you that this custom has already died out. If it remains, it's just a few fragments here and there. And here I am at the end of, the, in, in fact, in the early 21st century, discovering that even in the, in, the, in the late 20th century, this actually did continue in rural parts without any, any embarrassment. For legal purposes, one man would be the official husband on paper, but for all practical purposes, there would be two. And I think that disconnectedness or that even that the politics of embarrassment, the politics of feeling shame when it comes to certain aspects of our culture and not other aspects, which we exaggerate to the high heavens, that got me interested in, in trying to dig out and ferret out a lot of these stories. Wow. Okay. So a really, really interesting question from Naveen Kelvin. Uh, he says that there are so many, you mentioned about the original Ramayana. He says that there are so many versions of the Ramayana. So which one do we think of as original? How do we find out? Well, there is the original, what is often called the Valmiki Ramayana, which is what, if you ever want to read a translation or whatever, look up the word of Arshia Satar. She works on that so-called critical ed edition. But then there are later Ramayanas, and you can generally date a lot of these. So Kamran's Ramayana, which is in Tamil, came later. There are, I think there's a Jain Ramayana, in which Rama and Sita are not husband and wife, but siblings. You know, there's there's uh, all kinds of Ramayanas with all kinds of characters presented in different ways. In some cases, Sita is Ravana's daughter. In some cases, she's Mandodari's daughter, uh, you know, hidden away because she thinks Ravana will kill the child. Uh, in in, in Kamban's Ramayana, Meenakshi or, you know, Shurpanakha mm -hmm. is not some ugly, horrible, horrible sort of demoness. She's a beautiful woman who, you know, in 
from her point of view makes a very respectable proposition to rama to become you know his his wife or to you know have some kind of a relationship with him and rama is the one who ends up toying with her and sending to the blood brother and then the brother sends him sends her back and they do this little you know sort of game which is a rather you know rude thing to do i would say but yeah so you have all kinds of of stories like this but there is usually an original source and this is not just the ramayana even the gita we always talk of the bhagavad gita but the gita became such a major thing such a landmark that it's actually, there are plenty of other gitas there's the shiva gita devi gita all kinds of other gitas that we don't talk about it's the same thing that you find here that once an epic becomes popular different poets in different places keep adding subtracting changing and playing with it and it continues to our own time you know mt vasudevan nayar wrote a novel where bhima is the main uh, character and you know it's the, the whole story is told through bhima's perspective and it's quite quite a, an interesting retelling of of a great old epic malini do you want to comment on this question as well i know you have a pretty strong view about this as well sir on uh, sorry on the on the epics on well, how how different text especially mythological stories or you know his old history over the years uh, sort of changes and what is taken as original anymore yeah absolutely i mean uh, there are so many tellings of our stories i mean uh, there is a uh, telling of the uh, ramayana in uh, vaynar for example which uh, looks at uh, the epic altogether this country uh many of these tellings i mean wouldn't pass muster today i mean you, you'd probably be thrown into jail for uh, you know writing or talking about these things really uh, uh but it doesn't mean that they don't exist and i think in their own little corners these traditions continue and i mean thank god for that last words maladi and uh, manu and i'll hand over there are many many questions but i think in the interest of time i'm going to request both of you to share your your uh, inputs on you know how how we should not forget lessons from india's rich past and last words from both of you manu so me <laughs> okay no, well i can i you know i love giving examples and in in these days you know i, I practically give this example at every talk that i do which is you know you mentioned malini earlier about the the maratha princes uh, the essay or was it in the introduction but it was mentioned yeah. which to me is a wonderful example of you know not just something from the past that can teach us something today but also something that can make us look at the past in a completely different way this is basically you know chatrapati shivaji's nephew from the tanjavur branch of the marathas from shivaji's half brother Uh, ekoji and his son uh, shahu in the 18th century writes this telugu play now this is already interesting right marathi speaking king ruling in tamil nadu writing in the literary language of telugu uh, you know and and his subjects are all tamils and his courtiers are afghans and rajputs and all kinds of people anyway the protagonist of the story is a brahmin called morubhatlu the magnificent who's you know on his way to a pilgrimage with a chela with a disciple and in the distance he sees a leather working a woman like uh, she's from a leather working dalit caste and you know he decides that he must go and flirt with her and the chela the disciple is completely horrified he says no no think of the vedas think of the shastras you are a brahmin that's what you're supposed to do and the man says no no i don't want to insipid eternal bliss i want the bliss that comes with you know spending an evening with this lady so they go firstly she turns around she's a dalit woman so there's already a caste problem there uh, the other problem is she's married and you know the brahmin says no no don't worry think of you know as you would give your land to a brahmin as a gift you know give me your loins now the brahmin the, the woman is getting increasingly frustrated and she says how do i get rid of this 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 brahmin stalker of mine and she says oh you know we are low caste people you're such a high caste we can't have any dealings he says no no these rules we created for our own purposes you ignore those rules finally in her desperation she says i'm a woman from the leather working caste we deal we you know drink liquor and we also eat beef so i'm not pure enough for you and moro butlu the brahmin says well i drink cow's milk and i worship the cow you eat the whole cow you must be purer than me as malini said earlier these this is a dialogue that a, a playwright cannot can, cannot use today in the 21st century but in the 18th century we were still able we still had the confidence and the cultural security to be able to say something like that and take it with a sense of humor for a maratha king you know shivaji's nephew to be able to write something like this it tells you a lot about the confidence and the kind of cultural you know space that was available at that time to express ideas to express humor to laugh at oneself without constantly being in this holier than thou mode that many of us uh, have succumbed to in today's world 
so this this story in many ways encapsulates that the indian past is not about everybody sitting in a very chaste way and chanting mantras all day long and thinking pious thoughts no there was humor there was cruelty there were there were jokes there was laughter there was dissent there was standing up to injustice there were people who did all of these things and all of this together is what constitutes our shared heritage that we call indian history it isn't a monochromatic story it really is about multiple stories very many colors and not something that is black and white malini i think uh, actually that story uh, from the book is likely my most uh, favorite one i mean it's uh, completely irreverent um, and uh, it kind of pokes fun at every system uh, that was uh, prevalent then and uh, <clears throat> to see the this in cultures and performing practices across india kudiyattam for instance is full of really irreverent stuff i mean you know it couldn't be published today some of the yeah. stuff that goes uh, that goes for drama in kudiyattam you know uh, uh, every caste every community everyone gets uh, made fun of and i think that we should draw from these practices from our knowledge of these practices and from our uh, rarer historical texts uh to uh, you know create a more diverse understanding of our history and as manu said yeah to treat it with a little more humor acceptance and understanding yeah that's it so here's to irreverent and humorous times rini thank you so much uh, manu <clears throat> and malini for that really uh, interesting deep dive into history and culture and of course reminding us of these fascinating stories i wish history was taught to us like this uh, with all these shades and elements being shared and uh, you know encouraging us to seek out these stories and also to recollect them uh, in the same fashion as manu has shared in his books uh, it all you know kind of makes it so much more interesting and richer um, and 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 it's based on real facts it's not just some fiction which is being you know uh, encountered and, and and talked about so thank you very much um we're on to uh, the end of uh, knowledge factory 2021 we've come to